thank you so much for the introduction and thank you guys thank you guys for coming uh, so i'm 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 going to talk about you know how how we are going to speed up your existing python modules using rust but before getting started i just had this one question just to get a better understanding of the crowd how many of you have heard heard about rust before okay that's, that's actually a good number and i think i think that's good to work with but for people who have not heard about it you don't have to actually worry about the uh, the concept i'm going to explain from scratch so there are no prerequisites to this talks so uh, just you know sit back relax the things that you're going to learn is you're going to learn a completely new programming language and see how you could you know integrate that with your existing python stack and you know see if you can improve your uh, python performance uh so yeah before getting started uh, i want to talk about one of uh, my affiliations i'm i'm representing here as a uh, tech speaker i'm representing mozilla as a tech speaker here it's an amazing program uh, if you want to learn more about it do catch me later mm -hmm. i'm at uh, dvigneshwar in twitter so if you want to like uh, be in touch after this talk so that's the best way to be in touch with me so with this on this note let me introduce you to my title pumping up python modules using rust great so the elementary thing to do before you know when thinking about improving performance or things of that sort is to first identify where exactly is you know the bottleneck of your code there will be some part of your code or some part of in your python uh, uh, you know the whole stack that you have wherever which whichever part it falls into is to identify which part of your program is actually slow and how do people used to do that they use profilers once they use start using profilers uh, they kind of figure out uh, where exactly is the uh, where exactly is the python code really slow and then after which they analyze the problem the problem is to know how to solve that problem of you know that being slow or is there any is there any uh, what wh what's causing that bottleneck so we use some strategies over there think about using some other packages or tools and stuff but at some point of time uh, you know you you really need to get down to the machine you need to actually have kernel level access and things of that sort to actually solve these problems so that's where uh, knowing a system programming language really really comes handy so why do we need a native extension so for solving these kind of problems we do write native extensions which is nothing but you you build you build uh, an uh, an object uh, and uh, compile the uh, programming languages and try to integrate that with your python stack that's what a native extension means you could use c++ or rust and any other other sort of languages to do that i'll talk a lot more about that in the later sections uh, but the main reason why you would actually need a native extension with your existing python stack is that you probably want to improve your performance of your existing code because at the end of the day uh, a, a, a product which is fast and you know which can uh, which is which can maybe like you know with respect to the apis that you know uh, people are using these days with respect to machine learning and other uh, software service products uh, if you are able to write really, really really good backend you can save a lot of money too so that's why people actually really focus on uh, uh, having a better stack at the backend so performance is definitely a main uh, you know uh, problem to solve the again again is if you want to have more freedom Uh, with respect to memory access you want to do something with your kernel you you need a native extensions and of course like if you want to use low level kernel apis system programming languages tends to give you more better apis than python so this is where you would want to have a python wrapper over a system programming code so that you know you could integrate that with your existing stack and get that performance boost that you are looking forward to so how how does the python community address this problem it's very simple we go out and google it and then you we probably will find uh, you know some packages that solves this problem for you uh, and you could go ahead and use it if it is, if the ecosystem over there is pretty strong and if the maintainers are good i would highly recommend to go and use that uh, so here are some uh, you know really really good projects that have seen a lot of success massive success i would say in the recent years uh, more tended towards data science because i use these packages on my day to day life uh, so the, the reason why i put this here is you know writing native extensions in python is not new to python developers they have been doing that for a very long time it's just that you know we 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 really, we really don't go back to the back end code and see what exactly is happening so numpy for example is 53% c code literally that there's more python than uh, there's less python than more c tensorflow again is written most major part of tensorflow back end is written in c++ uh the python interpreter again is written in a, a, a low level language c Pillow is again an 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 very uh, interesting project which is used for you know a lot of imaging libraries in Python use it which again has a lot of uh, you know C code in it 
So the point is that you know you really need a system programming code if you are like building some complex projects. It 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 ends up over there. It's not necessary, but at end of the day, it goes. So it it tends to go to that particular uh, part of the stack. So the reality is that you know Python developers are not like really really comfortable C plus plus. I have taken like a small survey as to see how many Python developers actually know C plus plus. You might have done C plus plus in college or university. But for work, and especially if you're working for a you know a small company where you know you want to bring out the product really fast, that's where you I see like a lot of Python being used. They don't have time for C plus plus. So one of the major reasons that I like to use Python is that it's very easy to debug and you know get you get your idea really it's easy to prototype and get your idea out fast. So once you product this out and you know you you see this bottleneck in your code. And that's where you start to think, okay, I have to now learn C plus plus to solve that problem. Okay, that might be a bit difficult. Again, again with C plus plus, let's say you learn C plus plus and you wrote your uh, backend with C plus plus, but there are a lot of things that you know uh, C plus plus developers uh, face problem with. C plus plus developers are like Superman. I tell this everywhere. Like you know, there are very less Supermans in the world, right? And with C with, when you're being a Superman, you have problems with kryptonite, and there'll be always these hackers. Like Lex Luthor would come back with these kryptonite and try to, you know, uh, inject some kind of problems in your code. So the things like managing your memory manually, segmentation fault data, this is these are things that if you don't explicitly take care, uh, you you will probably end up in these kind of problems. But again, if you if you like look back, that's what we want on C++ as well. We want like maximum memory access from C++. But you have to be experienced enough to solve these problems. So what are the other options available out there before going ahead to writing system code? Because that's again an investment that you need to make, right? You have to invest a good amount of time to do that. So other options are use Python. Like you know, it's very easy to use Python. I think it is pretty mature as well. You just have to uh, you know make very very less code changes and build a native extension. So again, I would use that. It's in this particular code. You have to mention the types and the Python would like you know build and uh, or would dispatch a particular compile format which is Uh, performant or it gives you some kind of better co uh, performance than your existing uh, python code uh, number is again a very interesting project this is a just in time compiler to again you know get a compile format out for people how many of you are aware of just in time compilers before oh okay, great so the next talk is about that i believe uh, so this is going to give a small introduction to it so pypy is again uh, it's written in r python and what it basically does is it looks at your, it analyzes your code and sees which part of code can be you know compiled or uh, you know maybe optimized better so that's why that's what these just in time compilers do but uh, many times uh, when you're building these kind of extensions what you need actually is uh, you you want to be you want to have more control you want to more have control in sense what's actually going uh, under the hood so you can use these tools if these tools really work for you i would highly recommend them but if you want little more control over your code or what exactly is happening you would probably have to go ahead and write your own uh, native extensions so what is the main ask here the main ask is about c++ that which is uh, out there at the same time something that we could you know write fast as python developers i find c++ to you know it's, it's a bit difficult to get adjusted to it if you do a lot of if you have been into python for a very long time i think i have to press this button again yes sir. which which one is that press one press one last one Okay, do I have to? Um, okay, I think I have to bring my screen again. Yeah. So coming back to the point uh, is that you know, uh, like when you when you're doing C plus plus code, it, it's it's kind of difficult. There's a good amount of learning curve, and you need to get really experienced with it before you can write like production level code. So that's where I feel uh, you know Rust comes into place. Rust is the new state of art system programming language which is very easy to learn. Uh, it it's very similar to C++ with respect to syntaxes. It has all these high level iterators that we really love about Python. It has those and it is super safe. It 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 solves both uh, both problems like you know having more control and being super safe. That's what, that's one thing I really like about Rust. So the zen of Rust is very simple. You have memory safety without garbage collection. Uh, this is achieved through a concept called ownership and borrowing, uh, where you do uh, you you, you restrict uh, objects deterministically. I'll talk a lot more about that later when I come to ownership and borrowing. It has a rich type system. You need to you know it's very express. It's an expressive uh, an expression based language. It has all these high level iterators. Again, I'll I'll give you a brief introduction to that. It gives you freedom from data races. Uh, that's achieved through again ownership and borrowing. 
and a welcoming community just like uh, the python community is this is something that i really love about you know uh, python and rush community they are very welcoming if you have any kind of doubts people would be very happy to answer it and the ecosystem is gen uh, like you know building a lot of new packages are coming out that's that's a really interesting thing that's happening out there so let's look into facts and figures how people have actually used it um so wire is basically a messaging app and it does uh, it's it does a good job in encryption so what they basically did was they moved their encryption algorithms to rust and saw like a great performance boost and uh, this basically helped them in their standalone web app that gave them like really really good performance boost so they were pretty happy with it and i think it's it's a uh, that work is uh, worth you know giving a call out and again uh, with that was with respect to javascript and with respect to python uh, this organization called senetry so what they basically did was they wrote their source map uh, parsers in rust and they were, they got a real good uh, performance boost in that the person behind this project was also the person who wrote the flask uh, web framework uh, armin i believe his name is and yeah this is a great blog i would highly recommend to uh, recommend you guys to go check it out so with this in the field of you know embedded systems and ai uh, again this is a very interesting company that i am following i i believe their product is really good so they have an embedded voice assistant which is uh, which is not connected to the cloud and rust uh, under the hood uses llvm and llvm is a proved and a very good compiler uh, tool chain and most of the languages use that and using llvm the biggest advantage is you can ship to a lot of these embedded devices so they feel that using rust uh, they could ship it to like a lot more uh, devices their their code could be shipped to a lot more devices so that really worked out for them so again I, i would like to talk about the mini http uh, library again it uses a uh, a, pack, a crate or a library called tokyo which is a way to do null blocking io operations and that you could you could see the boost in um, the number of apis that you could process it's just uh, very high compared to the other languages out there it's again a very it's in the research it's at the research, research stage and uh, the active work is going on on these these aspects as well so these are not the only use cases i have there are so many other use cases where rust have been used it has been integrated to their stack in a very uh, a nice way and you know there are, there are these own applications and benefits of using rust in your existing stack so this is again a very cool thing that you know people are really proud about rust was voted one of the most loved programming uh, language third time in a row uh, this is really cool for a language it's really, really got whose stable version got released in 2015 So how did it all begin? So Mozilla is the company behind, you know, uh, creating the Rust language. But why do they do that? Uh, they are a browser company, right? End of the day, they ship Firefox to millions and millions of people, and for them, uh, browsers in general compete for performance and safety. So they, when when the major portion of uh, Mozilla Firefox was in C++, and they started this project called Server Project. So Server was an 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 a modern high performance browser which was experimenting with a lot of parallelisms and things of that sort. and most of the rust language development was happening through uh, the requests and the development of the server project and they used uh, finally they got uh, rust into firefox they wrote the first version of first version of rust got shipped in firefox uh, with the version 48 where they wrote their uh, url parser in rust it, it, they went ahead and rewrote most of their components using in, in rust the major portion of uh, firefox 57 was uh, written in rust if you had used firefox 57 you could exact you could you could visually feel that uh, performance boost so how did they do that they did that using the project quantum so uh this itself is a talk of its own like i can talk uh, uh, all day long about this so if you are interested in learning more about you know these components of a browser and how a browser works just catch me after this talk So the major caller would be the Stylo project, which is the rendering engine. So you, you you write CSS code for beautifying your websites, right? That needs to be rendered and you know shown as pixels. So that's like a lot of code <laughs> and a lot of complex code. So uh, it was rewritten in Rust, and uh, they got a really good performance boost. Worked really well for them. So let's look into some uh, Rust syntax because we'll be going into some detailed ways of creating extensions. It's very simple, like you know. I'm, I'm, I'm. If you, if you just pay attention to the next ten minutes, you're probably going to master that language. It is not like any other system programming language out there. So, to in order to declare a variable, you use the let keyword, right? And uh, the Rust compiler is smart enough to understand what type you are uh, inferring to, so you don't have to explicitly mention it. It figures out it by itself. By default, all the variables are immutable. Uh, you need you have to explic explicitly mention mutable type in order to do that. You will you you shortly come to know why 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 it's uh, designed in that way. Uh, constants is very similar to the other programming languages. 
the particular variable stays the same across the entire uh, program scope, you will have to explicitly mention the type unlike the let variable and you have to use the const keyword. Again functions use the fn keyword to uh, define a function. Uh, you will have to explicitly mention what type of uh, what data type are you taking as input to your function that you need to explicitly mention it and also mention what you are returning. One, one beautiful thing about that I really like is it improves uh, the readability of your code. So you exactly know what this part particular function takes in without even if you have like if comments and documentation is always good. But if it is not there, you could always refer to the function uh, definitions and understand what exactly the code is taking. This is something that I highly recommend to all the programmers out there because it really helps you to write, uh, you know, solve specific problems and write really good code. So you don't have to mention the return keyword for uh, returning back variable. The last line is inferred as return uh, return value. A flow is very similar to other programming languages. You have a condition and you have uh, true and false for uh, the same. If it uh, passes, you, you solve the function. You don't have to explicitly mention those uh, brackets. So yeah, uh, with, with you have a match statement in uh, Rush, which is very similar to the switch, if you are familiar with C++. So you have multiple uh, conditions that you want to pass. You give in the expression. So as I mentioned before, Rush is an expressive language, so you have to, everything is expression in Rust. So you have an expression here and you have multiple conditions to, you know, pass. So you, you have just a single variable, single value, it's the, uh, just you have to mention that value. You could use enums and any kind of types here. You have multiple values, you have a range of values and underscore is like the default way of doing it. Loops again very similar, uh, you have an infinite loop, you can use break to, uh, you know, uh, stop it whenever you want to, you have while conditions for. Uh, one, one thing to uh, you know, call out is that everything in Rust, if you want to do iterative operations, the type should be iterative in nature. So if you, you, you can use an expression here, but it should be able to support an iterative type. Uh, so that's a call out that you need to understand. Uh, Rust provides all these typical uh, types that you have in other stat static pro statically typed languages and uh, other things like array, slice, vector, tuples and structs. Uh, so array, if, you, if you're not familiar with this, array is a fixed uh, size of uh, you know, memory, a slice is a portion of it, a uh, vector is dynamic, you could, have, you could pop and push values, tuples are collections of data types, uh, structs are user-defined data types, I'll talk a little more about structs in my later slides. So one beautiful thing I really like about Rust is the cargo package manager. Uh, cargo is very similar to pip, but does more than pip, like uh, I've used pip extensively and cargo extensively, I've fell in love with cargo. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think a lot of uh, Python tooling exists around this uh, this side of the spectrum as well. So you have pip environment, which uh, I think we had a workshop on that the other day. Uh, th that you have like an, uh, a, a package manager, like a configuration management and the log files for it. Uh, Cargo works in a similar way, and you could do testing, benchmarking. You could ship your projects. You could, uh, you know, put it down to your CI/CD pipelines using Cargo. So now coming to the main concept of, you know, how Rust exactly works, how memory safety is given without a garbage collector in Rust. This is a concept of ownership and borrowing. So let's look at this uh, simple uh, Python code. You have a, a class called Circle, which basically takes in the radius and calculates the uh, area. So here I have a small, f have a function. Uh, which calls the which creates which creates three uh, circle objects and each and every, each and every time when I create a circle object it goes to the heap memory and once this function is executed what basically happens is you have a garbage collector software in Python which goes sees this this, this part of the memory is unused so I'm going to clean it uh, but the, pro the problem with the garbage collector is that you know it runs behind your code and it is a software which takes in a good amount of your uh, uh, hardware processing power. So you have a garbage collector which is continuously running. So how do we, uh, you know, solve this problem? And again, with respect to referencing, this is very similar to, uh, this is very common to us uh, for Python developers. Like, you could just give, you could pass variables and you don't have to worry about it. Everything would be taken care by the Python interpreter. But let's do the same thing in, uh, let's try to do the same thing in uh, Rust. So I create a variable, it has some type associated with it, and then I'm passing it on two new functions. What exactly happens is when you when you're trying to send it for the second time, uh, you would get a compiler. You'll get an error at, uh, in at compile time. It would just say that you know you can't pass this resource. Like I, when I when I saw this error for the first time, I was like, how how do you exactly code if you can't do this? Like, uh, what's wrong? 
and then it, if you can see the error it says that you can't use this value this value doesn't exist anymore uh, that's the concept of ownership everything is rust everything is in rust is based on scopes so a particular memory is associated with a particular scope so it literally means that that is the owner of that particular memory space and if you want to pass ownership you'll have to explicitly mention it so in rust everything is passing uh, ownership between different threads or different processes or different functions uh, so once a particular variable or memory space goes out of scope like when the particular function start finishes uh, its processing it is deterministic destructed it basically means there is no ownership for it and no one is going to use it anymore so i'm going to just you know remove it from my memory so that's what happened to the repair service so once you moved it to that function it got executed over there and since we didn't explicitly return it back the scope uh, it got uh, it it, uh, it went out of uh, scope and it was cleared so that catches these kind of uh, errors in at runtime at compile time uh, so how do you actually pass variables now if you're saying that everything is with respect to ownership how do i pass actually how, how can i how can i code like this like i need to pass things between different functions and different threads how do i do that that's where borrowing comes into picture so you can explicitly lend things by using ampersand symbol you are basically creating a reference uh so there are some conditions to this you can do it in different ways you can do it in an immutable and a mutable way an immutable way basically means that you know i'm passing the ownership to an another uh, thread or another function uh but it cannot make any kind of modification to my data set I, that's the immutable case and you could pass that kind of uh, uh, you know types to any num any number of threads or any number of processes but if you are giving a mutable type uh, you, ca you ca there can be only one there can be only one mutable reference at a time because you know it again comes down to ownership and borrowing or data race if you have multiple threads accessing the same memory location and trying to make some modification you know you'd never know what what that uh, memory location would have at some point of time that's the basic uh, idea of data race and uh, having a mutable reference you are making sure that you know only one thread or one particular function have access to that particular memory location Good. So with this, we are basically avoiding the garbage collector. Thanks to ownership and borrowing, we don't need do not need to have an explicit uh, garbage collector software that runs behind your code to manage memory for you. So how do you write custom data types in Rust? You use structs for that. Uh, structs are very similar to classes. You have your, you can define your own types. They have fields. They can be instantiated. And so you cannot you know partially fill in your struct. You have to explicitly mention all the uh, values in it. But you could use something. which is very which is very popular while you are doing error handling in rust where you explicitly mention these are the types but it is optional in nature that's what you know by the name it says that so rust structs can have methods you use the implement keyword to write uh, uh, methods for your structs so here like you know a doc can greet and this would become an implicit function of uh, the struct type so you have traits how do you extend functionalities be be for different types you could uh, you know uh, write different functions for different kind of uh types and implement the same trait so trait is something like an interface for different types and what it basically does is uh, when you at, at compile time it looks okay for what kind of type and how should i dispatch it so that is the concept of dynamic dispatch you have a v table where it looks up to for this particular type this this function is called i'm going to use it this way but uh this is like a lot of work right you have to explicitly mention all these functions for different kind of types how do i write it in a generic way so that was that's where generics comes into place you could write generic functions for uh, different kind of types and uh, call them by very uh, simple uh, you know uh, uh, changes a uh, generics is very common to you know system programmers where uh, by doing this you could reduce your code so there's this concept that do not repeat yourself uh, in and programming where uh, these things come into play so what when you write generics it is about static dispatching this is also known as the zero cost abstraction which the community uh, you know rust is evangelized for so high level iterator is rust let me give you a quick example of how it looks like so i'm trying to you know for this is very similar to python if you just take a quick look at it it's very very similar to python you have a line you're splitting it and you're searching for a word and then you have an accumulator where you're in increasing the total count value so if you write this the same thing in rust it would like you know it's okay you get around 250 milliseconds this, these numbers are just for illustrative purposes my change with respect to what the hardware that you're using but how do i write it using high level iterators in rust so you have to convert that particular type into an iterative type so use the into iter for that then use the map function all of these are given by standard libraries uh, similar similar to python like you have 
channel uh, uh, functions that you, you can use from the channel library of Python. Rust library has also uh, similar functions. So you use the map, and I call this WC line. I pass in the uh, inside the closure is the input data type, input type, and then it goes to the WC line. I split it again. I look. I use the filter uh, function. I catch the word, and fold is basically an accumulator, uh, which returns back the final value, and I sum it up. So I, f I want to parallelize this. So there is this cool create, a cool library in Rust, which will help you to do that. This is called Rayon, which is a very easy way to. Oh, I didn't do this. Sorry. Yeah. So using you could use the uh, package called Rayon, which is a data parallelism library in Rust, which converts your sequential operations into parallel one. So this is I think packages like these will be really really useful for Python uh, Python developers like us. So all that you had to change from the previous slide to this one was change from into iter to par into par iter. That's the only function change that you need to do. The underlying algorithm behind the Rayon crate makes sure that you uh, you you are free from data races. It guarantees that you'll be free from data races, and also converts your sequential operation into a parallel one. It's a pretty uh, useful thing, you know, when you are trying to gain some performance boost. So, how do you actually uh, develop and ship uh, Rust extensions in Python modules? So, this works through a, like a, a programming concept called foreign function interfaces. The way to do is uh, using CABI. CABI stands for C Application Binary Interfaces. So this is how languages communicate between each other. So when you are building a huge product and you need, um, you, you want to use the beauty of different languages, this comes handy. Uh, so you basically produce a C binding and integrate it with Python. That's how it works. So you, you write a for it function interface in Rust, and you know, uh, couple it with your Python module or Python project. So I like to you know visualize this as uh, Tony Stark and the Iron Man example. So as a as a Python developer, you you are basically Tony Stark. You are intelligent, and you have all the good things that are available with you. But in order to become a superhero and join the Avengers, you need Iron Man. So I like to see Rush that way. And I, I, I personally have been uh, doing this a lot. And I have, as a programmer, I have uh, enjoyed this. Like you get to learn uh, the both end of the stacks. Like high-level programming and system programming have a lot to offer. And uh, combining these both skills will be really useful uh, while you are developing your applications. This is again one of the main main motive why I'm giving this talk today. So to talk about uh, these capabilities. So in order to build the Rust uh, FFI module, first what you have to do is create a package, uh, because you're going to create a library project in Rust and integrate that with your existing Python stack. So in in uh, this is the cargo toml file um, where you mention what package you are uh, building with the version numbers. And you explicitly mentioned this is a dynamic library. You're going to ship this project as an .so file in uh, Linux systems or a uh, dynamic library in uh, OS X or .dll in Windows. So this is what uh, Rust compiler basically looks at this and so he says, hey, you know what? This project is going to be a library project. So I need to compile it in this particular format for this kind of machines. So that's how you do it. Uh, so again, you could do this in many ways. So right now, I'm going to talk about the standard uh, APIs that are available out there in the standard library of Rust. So standard FFI modules give you C strings. In the C strings, you could have types like C unit, C char. Uh, here we basically have two functions. Uh, the no mangle is basically an attribute which says that when you are creating these APIs for Python, just make sure that you're not changing the names. And here they've written it's a public API. It is unsafe because you know you don't you don't know what's going inside it. Uh, Rust does not give guarantees for these because it's an, it's an external programming language, but you have other ways to solve that. I'm going to quickly talk about it. So what we basically have here is uh, it takes in two integers from Python and converts it into a, uh, it, it, it finds the sum and converts into C U a UN type. And similarly for uh, you know taking in values from uh, Python interface and converting into C string. So the form pointer basically the, you know, does the con conversion. So from C strings, because everything happens at the C level, so from C strings you have to convert it to uh, Rust strings. So C strings takes care of those things. It's pretty cool to go out and check what's under the hood, at least for learning uh, purposes. Uh, amazing work out there. I highly recommend to go and check out this documentation. It's pretty huge, but uh, worth your time. Now, how do you ship it with your existing Python modules? Uh, you have to use the CFFI module, which is, in, which is available in uh, PyPy. Uh, install it, pip install it, and then you'll have to first define your uh, C extensions. That's where the C def function comes into place. And uh, let me see, yeah, C def function comes. You first create object, then you know, uh, uh, call the C def function, mention what you are, you know, using. It basically goes down over there, parses, understands how to use these APIs, and then yes, you could start using those functions in your uh, Python interface. 
so there are a lot of tools to do that i would highly recommend you guys to go check out these but yeah it is coming back to you know developing these extensions rust there are a lot of amazing libraries out there which you could use because you have complex types i just mentioned some integers and strings but there are like a lot more things that you want to do you want to access threads you want to pass in vectors the, you want to pass in your own uh, custom data types so that requires you know a little more uh, work to be done so that's where rusty python and pyo3 uh, pyo3 projects come into place i have i have actually play, played with rusty python that's why i have this course over there but the pyo3 community is very uh, active as well so let's look at this python example uh, i've i've imported my rust library and i'm having three functions here one i'm just trying to you know count doubles in a particular string uh, the first implementation i'm i'm using a zip and then i'm using some for loops and uh, if statements to find the total i'm using a regex uh, expression to do that the last part is i'm calling my rust function and uh, so i use the pytorch framework to benchmark to get some numbers out right to basically understand how this works so for people who have not used pytorch pytorch before uh, you just have to use this benchmark over there and it give you the uh, analysis post uh, you know running this so how do you write this uh, the function uh, rust first of all you have to start by importing the li uh, the library and uh, rust c python is c python is the create uh, it's very simple to the import statement that you see in rust here you have to mention extend uh, create so which in rust that's the syntax uh macro use uh, attribute basically says that i can use the macro which are available with the package i'm calling in some types python and py results uh python basically uh, holds the python interpreter gets that uh, you know memory safety for you and py results is the way to pass in different kind of string uh, of types between the python interface to uh, from rust to python interface so i have implemented the same uh, count double function using uh, for loops and zip and if else uh in if in uh, rust i've not i've not done anything fancy here and then i added as an interface you use the py module initializer macros to do that added to those apis what i basically saw was you know i got like 10 times the performance uh without doing anything much the language was very similar uh if you look at this particular count doubles function and this particular count doubles function there is no much difference the syntax are very similar and uh, but this is statically typed the beauty about this is uh being a python developer i can now write static code which is very similar to python uh, so again for doing a lot more complex operations this is my talk by my good friend nikita uh, on how uh, the different offerings that rust uh, gives you with respect with respect to foreign function interfaces i highly recommend to go check this out so with respect to the tooling uh, you have couple of good tools here so rust up is the uh, rust tool in, uh, the main um, installer for rust it allows you to go between different versions of rust you have the rust fmt for formatting rust script is a code linter cargo again a beautiful tool uh, the best part of you know rust which is a packet manager and then you have a lot of un unofficial uh, tooling out there again with the community everything in rust works with an rfc process you want to bring in some change into rust you go you write an a uh, proposal the community reviews it and that's how it progresses uh the creates.io is the website where you can go and uh, check out all the different kind of uh, crates that are available out there from the rust community so very similar to pypy uh to summarize what we can do is you know with uh, cu currently like I, i what i try to do is if there are some algorithm part of your code or if there is some kind of heavy lifting that you want to do you could probably consider rust uh, try it out you know benchmark it and see how it works uh again like you know you could, you could imp imp implement um, concurrency paradigms using rust which will again give you uh, a lot of performance boost for accessing hardware i have seen this use case to be very popular but just make sure that you know uh, this this is done in a very uh, smart manner this these calls between different programming languages are not uh, you know uh, are non trivial like these 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 cost you some time so be make sure that you know your application fits in it's just not about you know passing all your api request to rust because in that case you're not going to get any performance boost because this maybe you can uh, you know accumulate a thousand api calls and you know you can asynchronously process them in rust so that would probably give you a performance boost or if you're doing ai or machine learning you want to take your algorithm part write it in rust get performance boost over there or if you're doing some kind of pre processing i think rust would be very uh, useful over there as well so what does rust to uh, rust has to offer it's a modern C++ re uh, replacement. If you're like me, who wanted to get into system programming and then found C++ to be a bit difficult, uh, Rust is a good, uh, you know, uh, replacement for that. Not exactly replacement, but yeah, of course, you would get all those concepts that you wanted to learn in C++ in Rust, and then probably learn C++. You know, learning more languages is always good. 
I, I, I don't get into this language <laughs> wars because I, I feel that every language has something to offer. Again, as I mentioned before, ownership and borrowing, uh, you know, make sure that you don't need a garbage collector to have memory safety. You don't have no runtime in Rust. You have Rust type systems and a very strong functional programming interface. So yeah, feel really awesome. Uh, you know, be, be a Python developer, have the Iron Man suit, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> and go out there. I put in some good uh, talks and links in this particular URL, so I highly recommend you guys to go check it out. Uh, yeah, feel free to you know ping me. I would be happy to take some questions now. Thank you so much. Uh, let's start with questions. Yep.